good afternoon. I'm glad to see so much green amongst us this afternoon. Uh, that's the best I could do. I didn't have any green neckties or something <laughs> like that. <clears throat> but this one has a green background about it. So, you know, th this is the famous quote from the porter in uh, Macbeth. And it points out how Shakespeare was way ahead of his time in understanding uh, effects of alcohol. Uh, at least those effects that uh, uh, were somewhat tolerable, let's say. So <laughs> he pointed out also in the thing that it makes you drowsy and a little bit sleepy. We're going to hear more about that. And the central nervous system produces sleep and it promotes the flow of urine. Finally, many years later, I think it was shown that it inhibits antidiuretic hormone. Uh, release, another central effect. But the thing that's attracted much attention, of course, is that it, as far as lechery, sex is concerned, it promotes the desire but diminishes the performance. And I think we now, in today's world, we also have an explanation to account for these events. But all of these are somewhat within the, I wouldn't call them all socially acceptable, but at least livable. But it's below the line that the trouble occurs when alcohol becomes associated with <clears throat> many events in our society, which you know, which in their cumulative nature uh, constitute major threats to life uh, and uh, injury. And the two areas of major, quote, intoxication that are going to be discussed uh, by uh, our distinguished guests this afternoon. I deal with the central nervous effects primarily with respect to addiction, intoxication, withdrawal, what's going on in the brain. And the second is the association with cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, for many years, anyone who had yellow eyes was sort of ostracized from society because people said even though they didn't agree, they must be an alcoholic. It was the thing. Well, it still is the thing, and it's prevalent all over the world, and people aren't all jaundiced with it, but they may be dying from it. And we're going to hear this uh, very elegant discussion of the relationship between alcohol and liver disease. Is it reversible? For years, people argued that it wasn't the alcohol, it was the calories you were taking, and that went on literally for decades. But we have some answers now, largely due to the work that we're going to hear uh, presented. So let me briefly introduce our two speakers. Uh, the, the first speaker is Dr. George Koob, who is director of uh, NIAAA. Uh, uh, he received a Ph.D. in behavioral physiology at Johns Hopkins and, and then spent many years uh, in San Diego at the Scripps Research Institute, where he was director of the Alcohol Research uh, Institute. Uh, and he was professor and chair of the Scripps Committee on Neurobiology of Addictive Diseases. Now, anybody who reads anything about mechanisms of alcohol effects in the central nervous system is bound to come upon uh, Dr. Koop's uh, papers, several of which we posted on the website, which I bring to your attention, those of you who are not uh, familiar with it. Our second speaker is uh, Ben Gao, uh, who received his medical training in uh, China uh, at a very famous medical school. Uh, do any of you know who Norman Bethune was? Well, don't be surprised. It's an unusual name for a medical school in China, but the reason is Norman Bethune is one of the great heroes of Chinese history, particularly during the Long March. Uh, he was a thoracic surgeon from Canada and eventually wound up as a 
uh, very critical part uh, of the success uh, of the communist effort uh, to unseating uh, the Kuomintang and so forth. And he really devoted his life uh, to excellent health measures, including the introduction of uh, pneumothorax for the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis, which he had and was treated uh, in that way, et cetera. Very well-known man in the whole field of the history of thoracic surgery, who is a national hero uh, in China and also in Canada, where his home is a museum that visited each year by a distinguished delegation from China. Well, this isn't a demystifying medicine on Norman Bethune, but you might find it interesting to read about him. Uh, so perhaps we begin, Dr. Ku. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this. It's uh, really um, hopefully be fun, and I, I look forward to any questions you may have uh, once once we get into it. So, so what I thought I'd do is tell you a little bit about alcohol, but I'm going to use a, a neurobiological, neurocircuitry perspective uh, rather than just do a, a kind of pharmacology lecture. In fact, uh, as was already pointed out, Shakespeare was very good at describing the pharmacology of alcohol, so you pretty well know how it works at this point. Um, but, but the bigger issue really is, the, and, and the one our institute is dedicated towards, is trying to uh, address the problems of excessive drinking and, and, and the cost of society. And it's, it's actually quite prodigious. Um, alcohol can, you know, costs us about $223 billion a year. And, and we, you know, have about 17 million people who are afflicted with an alcohol use disorder of some, some kind. And many of them meet criterion that we used to call alcohol dependence or, or alcoholism. And I'll talk about that in a second. And, you know, drugs and tobacco are, are uh, combined, have a, have a similar impact on our society. So it always begs the question, and, and so I'm going to, this talk is going to be a little bit of a conceptual framework and a little bit of uh, data and a little bit of a, a picture of, of addiction in general, but alcoholism in particular. And so that's what I would like to convey to you. You know, it always begs the question, what, what really is addiction? What is alcoholism? What is alcohol dependence? And, and I could literally spend my whole time here going through the history of how we define those terms and so forth. But I think almost everyone would agree that that addiction and alcoholism is chronically relapsing disorder characterized by a compulsion to seek and take the drug or stimulus and loss of control and limiting drug intake. And when we talk about loss of control, it doesn't mean that a drug addicted or an alcoholic is not in control of their daily alcohol intake. They are. But what we mean by that loss of control is they can't stop. All right? And, and there are many phenotypes of, of, of a someone with an alcohol use disorder, from a binging 18-year-old or 21-year-old to, to the, you know, the dean of the medical school who's hiding the bottle in his glove compartment and in his desk, uh, in the desk at home, and, and seems to be perfectly normal most of the time until they have some liver event, like Ben will tell you about, and end up in the hospital and go through severe withdrawal. So, you know, it's a, it's a large phenotype. But, but there's also another part to the disorder that I think is critically important for the way I think of what alcohol does to our brain. And that has to do with my add-on here, which is what I call the, the emergence of a negative emotional state when access to the drug or stimulus is prevented. And I call this the dark side of addiction. I've written quite a lot about it um, and will probably continue to write quite a lot about it because I think it's one of the key parts, the kind of the keystone of, of the instability of our emotional systems that drugs convey when they're taken in excess. And I'll explain what I meant by that in a minute. But to make it very even more simple, I'm going to argue that addiction has three components. And I always put on this slide, and I always realize that it says one, two, and four. So still haven't fixed the slide. But in any event, 
Addiction is an incentive salience disorder. I'll explain what that is in a few minutes. Addiction is a reward deficit disorder. It's a, and a stress surfeit disorder. And it's the executive function disorder. And I'm going to explain those three terms, four terms, in succession. Um, and I'm going to link them neuroanatomically to your brains. But before I do that, I want to make the argument that addiction and alcoholism is a moving target. It, it consists of different stages. And those stages reflect the, the functional changes I was just talking about. And most of them are obvious and self-explanatory, all right? Everybody here knows what binge intoxication means. Shakespeare described it very well. Uh, and that's when you're engaged in drinking and, um, and possibly drinking to excess. Withdrawal negative affect is the withdrawal stage. And I focus on the, the negative affect part of that, the emotional part. And I'll explain that later. And preoccupation anticipation may be a little bit dense. Um, it really comes from social psychology, and you just substitute the word craving if you prefer. But it's a part of all of these addictive-like disorders, and you can even superimpose pathological gambling on this if you want. You'll see that it fits the cycle. Now, where does this cycle come from? Well, I spent years at the University of California, San Diego, on my own time teaching a course called Impulse Control Disorders, and one of the things that I realized is that if you go back in psychiatry, you find that there were two disorders that describe components of addiction. One was an impulse control disorder. And that's shown in the blue here. And the other was a compulsive disorder, which is shown in the red. Now, the archetypal impulse control disorder was kleptomania. And the archetypal case history was a guy who walks into the supermarket in a trench coat and um, and he's very excited, and the beads are growing, sweater growing on his forehead, and, and the tension is getting larger and larger, and he's trying to find where they sell the lobster cans. And he finally finds the seafood, the canned seafood aisle, and he finds the lobster cans, and it, the, it, the urges are just overwhelming, and he stuffs his coat full of lobster cans, and he exits the store, and a great sigh of relief comes over him, and he, and he this huge feeling of reward and pleasure. And he goes home, and he takes the lobster cans, and he throws them in the closet. He doesn't eat seafood, OK? And it's that excitement, that risk-taking that contributes to this impulsivity. And maybe surreptitiously, he returns to the lobster cans at some later date. There's not a whole lot of withdrawal in those kind of impulse control disorders. But the other disorder, which is obsessive compulsive disorder, and that's the archetypal syndrome. There's a great deal of anxiety and stress produced by delusions, obsessions. A person has, feels that they have to relieve that, they have to engage in repetitive behaviors. And a great depiction of this was Jack Nicholson in the movie As Good As It Gets. And nobody does psychopathology better than Jack Nicholson. And if you don't believe me, then you know watch the movie the Shining, OK, which is even worse. But if you take an impulse control disorder and a compulsive disorder and merge them together, you, in effect, end up with the addiction cycle. And to make a short story long, there are two sources of reinforcement in addiction and in this, these cycles. One we call positive reinforcement, and one we call negative reinforcement. And positive reinforcement you all know about, you know, go to SeaWorld, watch the dolphin jump through the hoop, and watch the trainer slip the dolphin a fish. And every time they jump through the hoop, they get a fish, and that's how they were presumably trained in the first place, and that's what keeps their behavior uh, motivated. But negative reinforcement is something that is really people don't get their head around very well, even in psychology departments. And it really is where you increase the probability of a response by removing an aversive stimulus. In the case of addiction, we're talking about the removal of that negative emotional state. And this becomes critical if you want to understand what I'm going to talk about today and, and how alcohol impacts your emotional systems. You've got to understand the concept of negative reinforcement. Now, for you in your daily life, it could be a boss that yells at you all the time. Every time you step in their office, they yell at you. So what's your response to that? You go back to your cubicle and you play video games because you don't want to deal with this 
this very aversive stimulant, all right? But it increases the probability that you're going to be doing video games in your office because you don't want to deal with this boss who just yells at you no matter what you do, all right? So that's negative reinforcement. And my argument is that addiction is a combination of the two sources of reinforcement. But as you move through this cycle and it gets worse and worse, more and more of what drives your behavior is negative reinforcement. So then we can get even more complicated and we can argue that these parts of the addiction cycle and these sources of reinforcement are actually mediated by separate circuits in the brain. And this is color coded for those of you who are neuroanatomically challenged. Um, this is the nose, this is the front of your brain, this is the back of your brain. And you can see the blue is the binge intoxication stage, the green is the preoccupation anticipation stage, and the red is the withdrawal negative affect stage. And without going into a great deal of detail, it, and you don't have to be a trained neuroscientist to realize that the green's on the outside and the blue and red are on the inside. And to put it in even more simplistic terms, the green and blue are your reptile brain, and the, I'm sorry, the red, the red and blue are your reptile brain, and the green is, in effect, your cortex, which is what makes you human. And it's largely frontal cortex that we're going to talk about. So let's have a little bit of pharmacology. Let's take a little further what, what William Shakespeare said, and note that there is a dose effect function with alcohol. It's a critical one, and Ben will talk about this as well. But if you measure blood alcohol levels, and they're usually measured in milligram percent or gram percent, I think most of you know that the legal limit for drinking is 0.08, which is 80 milligram percent, and you can see why on, when you look at this curve. Gram percent is simply the number of grams in 100 milliliters of your blood. It's that simple, all right? And you can measure it with a breath analyzer. You can measure it with a blood test. Um, and at low doses, we get relaxation, disinhibition, as William Shakespeare talked about. You, it's a social lubricant. Um, you know, I like to tell people that probably every cocktail party on Capitol Hill has alcohol for its social lubricant properties. And the Research Society on Alcoholism opens its meeting with a cocktail party, all right? And so 70% of Americans drink, and most of them have no problem whatsoever. But, but some do. And one of the things that we're trying to convey at the Alcohol Institute is the fact that this part of the curve exists. And so when you get to 0 0.08, 80 milligram percent, this is when you have trouble driving. This is when you have impaired vision, uh, peripheral vision. This is when you're ref you may think you can drive very well, but your reflexes are not quite what they were. And as you move up in dose, alcohol can kill you. And there was some on the news two days ago of, of some Brazilian students who were playing a, a drinking game and decided to drink 21 shots of vodka in one minute, and one of them died. And three of them were in serious condition in the hospital because they were, I can tell you where their blood alcohol was. It was somewhere around here. Right? You drink a whole bottle of scotch, you're going to have a blood alcohol level at the effective dose 50%, which means that 50% of the people in this room who drank a bottle of scotch would be dead in about an hour. So, so how does alcohol work? How does it have all these myriad of effects from the good, the bad, to the ugly? How does this happen? Well, alcohol, I call it the two faces of Janus. So Janus was the god of transitions for, 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 for the Romans, the god of uh, adolescence to adulthood, the god of, of life to death. Stood, statues stood out in the front of the, the, the door of Rome to protect them from intruders and so forth. And, uh, and we always think of two pieces of this puzzle that are that interact strongly, reward and stress. I've talked about reward, which is basically positive reinforcement. Any stimulus that increases the probability of response and, and has a hedonic connotation. Stress is any challenge to homeostatic processes. Some of you know that a small amount of stress can be rewarding. Think skydiving, all right? To some extent, you can think of kleptomania in that domain. Um, although kleptomania is not culturally accepted for the most part. Um, on the other hand, 
we also know that excessive reward leads to an activation of the brain stress systems. And I'm going to try and make that point in a few minutes here. So I'm challenged. I'm, I've been challenged with telling you how does alcohol work. Well, the first place alcohol works is on this part of your brain that's called the basal ganglia, which is important for moving toward things in the environment that are important. Now, if you've heard Nora Volkoff talk, she probably talked about incentive salience and the dopamine system. But one of the processes that's involved is the release of dopamine that triggers a, a linkage between a stimulus in the environment and whatever good it's doing to you, the good feelings inside. So if, it, for, you know, for a honeybee, finding nectar in a flower, that probably induces a release of octopamine, which is the equivalent in a honeybee. And that makes the honeybee remember where that flower is. They go back to the hive. They do a little dance to tell the other honeybees. But it has high incentive salience, that flower now, because it was loaded with nectar. And, and it, this is highly conserved function in, in uh, animals. And, and so even honeybees and lizards have a dopamine system and presumably get reward from finding objects in the environment that are pleasurable and having them linked up to stimuli that were previously neutral. And this is all what your dopamine system does. Alcohol releases dopamine. But alcohol also has another powerful effect that's like opiate drugs. Alcohol releases opioid peptides or endorphins. So I'm going to show you two examples very quickly that come in a minute from human brain. But there's been an enormous amount of work funded by the National Institutes of Health over the last 30 years to delineate a circuit in the brain that makes you feel good. And this is the circuit. Um, this looks very complicated, but this is that same nucleus accumbens I just showed you. This is the nucleus accumbens, the blue part of your basal ganglia. And you see opioid peptides coming in and dopamine coming in. And you can put your favorite drug wherever you want on this diagram. This comes from Eric Nessler, one of my colleagues who's at Mount Sinai. And alcohol, you'll notice, is pretty much everywhere. So alcohol influences circuits in two major ways. It activates dopamine system, and it activates opioid peptides. In fact, for many years ago, in a galaxy far, far away, we actually blocked opiate receptors in the nucleus accumbens, and rats stopped drinking, OK? Later on, not too long ago, Howard Fields and, and Jennifer Mitchell at the Gallo Center and the University of California, San Francisco, did a human study where they did PET imaging, and they looked at the displacement of uh, a high-potency opioid, this is fentanyl, that was labeled. And they were able to show that when somebody drank the equivalent of about two to three drinks, there was an enormous decrease in the binding of this opioid drug, which suggests that something had to be displacing the fentanyl. Somebody had to push this label off that receptor. And of course, the argument is that it was endorphins, and the place it was doing it was in the nucleus accumbens. That's a human brain, right? Beautiful study, elegantly, in a sense, proving to me what we had seen in rat studies uh, a decade before, but, but showing that in the human brain, there is a nucleus accumbens, and it does have endorphins. And then Nora Volkoff, the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, showed exactly the same thing in human subjects, so uh, alcoholics, actually. So if, if you give um, uh, if you give human subjects methylphenidate to challenge the dopamine system, um, what you find in controls is that there's a, there's a release of dopamine. But in alcoholics, there's no release of dopamine. The dopamine system's compromised. And there's other data that, that's been generated to show that, that dopamine is released um, in normal subjects, which is what you see looking at the control subject and, and going this direction, there's, there's a decrease in, in release of uh, in dopamine D2 receptors. But in the alcoholic subjects, this methylphenidate-induced release is blunted. And so this is the first indication that something's going wrong in the dopamine system when you drink a lot. And this was an elegant study that she published some time ago to support that hypothesis. 
As you excessively drink, the circuitry starts to change and you start to engage the dopamine system in the dorsal part of the striatum, which is another part of the basal ganglia. And you say, well, so what? Who cares? What's, what's the big deal? Well, this is where we form habits up here in the dorsal part of the basal ganglia. This is the part of our brain that forms good habits, like putting on your seatbelt, click, but it's also the part of your brain that engages bad habits. And when you start to think that dopamine release triggers habit formation, you begin to realize that a drug that, that induces excessive dopamine release is going to excessively lay down habits that are linked to taking the drug. This is particularly dramatic when you're talking about methylphenidate or methamphetamine, but David Lovinger in the intramural program at NIAAA and many others, I might add, have shown exactly the same thing for alcohol. As you get more compulsively involved in the alcohol, you start engaging more and more of the habit to take alcohol. It's really fascinating work. So I don't want to move to the dark side. This is one of my favorite all-time paintings, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but basically this lady doesn't look very happy. And she's drinking a drink that contains high amounts of alcohol, but also a, a, a convulsant drug called Thujone. And, and that brings me to then what happens? What happens to the brain once you've engaged in this ex ex excessive drinking? And you notice that I've labeled the nucleus accumbens now in red, and I've added two structures, the bed nucleus stria terminalis and the amygdala, as part of my reptile brain. And one of the things that we know is that the nucleus accumbens loses its power to release dopamine. And that slide I showed you from Nora Volkoff showed that dramatically in an imaging study. But there's something else that goes wrong. I'm going to skip this. We're going to, we're going to run out of time, and I want to have been to have enough time. So there will be a couple slides I'm going to skip because I spent too much time in the beginning. But but I'm going to hit on the main points that I wanted to cover. So what I told you from Nora's work is that when we first take a drug, an alcohol no exception, we activate these pleasurable neurotransmitters. But as we keep taking the drug, there's a compromised function in these neurotransmitters. Some of it is decreased release. Some of it is changes in transduction function factors. Um, some of it is probably other biochemical mechanisms being engaged. But there's another piece to the situation that is critically dependent on those other structures that I added in to the dark side there, the red. And that has to do with engagement of your brain stress systems. And this is a little vin uh, snapshot of it, but I'm going to talk quickly about a couple of neurotransmitters that get recruited when you excessively drink alcohol. And this all comes from really pioneering basic research that was done initially at the Salk Institute. <clears throat> I was there at the Salk Institute when Wiley Vale discovered corticotropin releasing factor. <clears throat> Many of you probably accept the fact that it is well known to, to activate the pituitary adrenal axis. But what we didn't know at the time when this peptide was discovered in 1981 was that it also drives your sympathetic response to stress and it also drives your behavioral response to stress in that amygdala, that other red bit that I was talking about. And so in a study one of my postdocs did a, a long time ago now, we trained rats to self-administer alcohol, shown here. They're pressing a lever to get alcohol in a 30-minute session. But the animals were made dependent. And I'm not going to go into the details, but the dependent rats drank four times as much alcohol as the non-dependent rats. So these are the non-dependent social drinkers, if you will. These are rats. And they're drinking the equivalent of a glass of wine in 30 minutes. But the dependent animals, in 30 minutes, in 30 minutes, were putting away four drinks, OK? Believe me, the rats were mellow when they came out of the cage. But we could reverse that over-drinking by administering selectively in the dependent group a CRF antagonist. And that's why I'm actually showing you some data here. And you can see there was no effect of the CRF antagonist in the non-dependent drinkers, but a huge effect in the dependent drinkers. 
we went on to show, and many others have gone on to show, that CRF antagonists can reverse a lot of the signs and symptoms of alcohol dependence in rodents. But at the same time, again, a long time ago, and one of the messages from my talk is that things in science have to incubate a little bit. They have to grow, and they have to be picked up and re-examined. It's almost like, if you pardon the pun, a good bottle of wine, okay, that has to age. And this was a story that was developed by Bill Carlazon, who's at Harvard, and again, Eric Nessler, who's at Mount Sinai, where they speculated and hypothesized, it wasn't much of a speculation because they had hard data, that if, it, if you excessively took opiates or cocaine, and we know now alcohol fits the same picture, you activated cyclic AMP and cyclic AMP response element binding protein which in turn activated another peptide, a peptide called dynorphin. Now, I don't know whether you've ever heard of dynorphin, but dynorphin binds to kappa opioid receptors. Kappa opioid receptors make you miserable. Mu opioid receptors relieve your pain and make you high and very relaxed and block your memory of pain in particular. But kappa opioid receptors make you dysphoric when they're activated. And this just sat there for about 15 years, 10 years, in the literature. That overactivation of the reward system drove this opponent-like process of excessive activation of dynorphin. And then it wasn't, you know, I'd like to say that we came in on a silver horse, but it wasn't us, actually. But one of my postdocs who pestered the hell out of me until I let him do the experiment, Brendan Walker, who's now a professor at, um, at the University of Washington, uh, at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington State. But during this period, uh, Bill Carlazon picked up on the Kappa story and continued it, and, and so did Bill Ch uh, um, Charlie Chafkin. And, and now they've been having regular Kappa meetings for the last uh, four years. But Brendan absolutely insisted that we had to look at a Kappa antagonist. And I kind of yawned most of the time, but I finally said, well, Brendan, if you want to do the study, go ahead and do the study. So again, same paradigm. Rats are drinking a lot of alcohol that are dependent. And here are his controls. His controls are drinking a little bit more than in the previous slide. He gave a cap antagonist. He repeated, kept increasing the dose. And eventually, he got to a dose where the cap antagonist completely eliminated the excessive drinking. Again, selectively not touching, if you'll permit me, the social drinking. So yet another peptide that makes you feel lousy, and if you block that feeling lousy, you stop excessive drinking. So I think you can see why I personally am a big advocate of negative reinforcement and why I think it's critically important for the process of misuse of alcohol that we talk about. So I'd like to argue with you that when you excessively drink alcohol, you shut off your reward system but you recruit your brain stress system. And that's the argument. And that's my passion. I have a lab at NIDA right now where we're pursuing some of these questions. We still want to know more about this circuitry. We want to know how CRF and dynorphin interact, for example. We know that glucocorticoids can drive some of this. We want to know how. Why do they drive this system and not the system in the paraventricular nucleus? We've got a lot of questions we'd like to answer before I hang up my electrode. Um, just to tantalize you that, that those of you who actually know that there are a lot of transmitters in the brain, it's not just CRF and, and dynorphin, but there's a whole herd of neurotransmitters that we now know are in both involved in emotional processing to make you feel lousy. And believe it or not, we have a, a, a growing group of transmitters, one of which are endocannabinoids, that probably mellow out your stress system. So you have reward, stress, and anti-stress all built into our central nervous system to regulate what we call homeostasis. Now, last thing I want to just touch on very quickly is that I told you that there was a green bit. I told you that it was largely frontal cortex. And here's a blow up of that. And we now know that the frontal cortex system controls your stress system and controls your impulsivity system. It controls both of them. So this is 
You can call it whatever you want. You can call it your uh, superego. You can call it executive function. You can call it um, decision making. You can call it the stop system. But we know that this part of our frontal cortex is critical for controlling these kind of excessive behaviors, either stress dominated or impulse dominated. And the other part that you young people should realize is, and those of you who are, you know, parents of young people should realize perhaps even more importantly, is that unfortunately, this part of our brain doesn't fully develop until the age of about 25. So one of the big thrusts of our work and, and currently also of NIDA is to try and understand how drugs of abuse are affecting the, the, the development of this frontal cortex system. But we know now that this may be a, a key trigger in, in the process of addiction. And this is a study that Rahita Singha's group published fairly recently in the American Journal of Psychiatry showing that the, the more gray matter deficits in alcohol-dependent patients, because alcohol affects your frontal cortex and reduces function in your frontal cortex and may actually ultimately kill neurons in your frontal cortex. And this is an image of the frontal cortex and imaging the amount of gray matter. The more of a deficit, the faster you relapse in a recovery program. So it not only impacts on the beginning of the addiction process to get you into the system where you have more impulsivity and more stress that I spent all this time telling you about. But we also think that as the cycle continues, it may impair your executive function and impair and slow down your recovery process. So the frontal cortex is looming more and more important in the effects of alcohol. So I'm just going to finish up now, turn it over to Ben, but this is I think I've given you a pretty good explanation of how alcohol fits into this addiction rubric. Obviously, I've focused on my pet love, which is the fact that alcohol impairs your reward system when it's taken in excess, but also triggers an activation of your brain stress system, maybe better than any other drug of abuse. That's a, a question that remains to be determined, but I can tell you that alcohol's effects on CRF are probably the most dramatic of all the drugs I've looked at. And so here's what I said. You know, uh, alcoholism is a syndrome of compulsive alcohol seeking composed of multiple stages and a hijacking of multiple sources of reinforcement. I've argued that there, there are explanations for this within the binge intoxication stage. There are brain reward circuits. Early neuroadaptations of the nucleus accumbens and basal ganglia involve activation of incentive salience and habit formation via the activation of the dopamine and opioid peptide system. In the withdrawal negative affect stage, brain anti-reward systems, um, uh, we find brain anti-reward systems, the reward system deficits, decreases in dopamine and opioid peptide function, and brain stress system recruitment uh, increases in CRF and dynorphin in the extended amygdala are driving this negative effective state. And then finally, I didn't go into great detail, but the executive function deficits that we associate with the frontal cortex, we're now learning um, that these com contribute to impulsivity and compulsivity. And I didn't talk about the neurotransmitters involved, but there's a lot of work in the literature led by uh, a number of investigators suggesting that this is a glutamatergic uh, a deficit dysregulation. Glutamate is one of the major transmitters in these neurons that project from the frontal cortex to these to your reptile brain. And thank you very much. So please, uh, you have questions or comments? We'd like you to use the microphone because there are several hundred people who are watching and they can't hear the question, but they can hear the answer, and then they send me emails and say, what's the question? Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, I read some, about some studies and some anecdotal evidence of people going on psychedelic trips with 
like LSD or other drugs, and then suddenly, pretty much instantly breaking their alcoholic addiction. Have you researched this at all? Uh, I haven't personally researched it. It's a very, very old story. I mean, LSD hit the American scene in the 60s okay. by um, Albert Hoffman, who developed it, giving it to Stanford University for human studies. There was a brief, shiny moment when methylene dioxymethamphetamine was uh, reduced to, a, I think, a Schedule three drug for the hope that it would speed up the psychotherapeutic process. And there's, there's probably some truth to the fact that psychedelic drugs can, in individuals who tolerate them, you know, shortcut the psychotherapeutic process. But unfortunately, the side effects and, and the problems associated with using psychedelic drugs have left most of us in science off to the side of that. Um, I mean, psychotherapy can be very useful some, for individuals who, who want treatment for mental disorders. But the shortcut using psychedelics can work, but it can go really haywire. And Ted will give you more details if you want. Right, Ted? <laughs> About the psychotherapeutic process going haywire. So it's a, it's a dangerous kind of approach. Hi. Hi. I was wondering um, what's actually happening at the level of the cell in terms of when you have alcohol. Is there some is there some sort of membrane destabilization or is there a direct interaction with a receptor? You know what, what's what's happening because it has it seems to have quite a drastic effect on multiple receptors, etc. And so I was wondering if the, if you knew anything about that. The answer is no, and 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 as remarkable as that may sound, we're thinking we are in the process of putting together an RFA, a request for, fun, uh, you know, a funding announcement to look at 10 millimolar alcohol. Um, over the years, there's been an argument that alcohol works at doses that would be the equivalent of one drink. That's around 10 millimolar uh, on GABA receptors, glutamate receptors. Um, uh, glycine sites perhaps on one of those two receptors. I, I know that there is an extrasynaptic GABA receptor where one group at least has argued that doses between 10 and 20 millimolar are activating it. It's thought that alcohol likes to hang out in the hydro, the water pocket and influence hydrophilic, I mean hydrophobic components. That way there is a paper not too long ago, I think a year ago in, in Nature on that subject by uh, the group uh, from Texas who did it with also the um, Institute Pasteur. So, but very little is known about how actually alcohol works at the molecular level. Um, you know, it doesn't just jiggle membranes, but it does seem to hang out in certain pockets that are water pockets in the membranes that maybe are allosterically modulating certain receptors, and we want to know what they are. It's a very good question. Go ahead. Oh, hi. So uh, I want to ask, what is the reason of the death after alcohol drinking? The, the what? The reason of the death. The death. Yeah, the, 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 the Australian boy. <laughs> yeah, why die? Oh, why do you die? Oh, that's it. Uh, I think that's pretty easy. It shuts off your respiratory drive in the brainstem. Brain. Yeah, I mean, there is a, a probably at those kind of doses, you're talking about membrane changes that would and, um, and, and that, I, I don't know, I mean, Ben, would it be calcium changes? Uh, you know, I, at some do at those doses, you're, you're shutting off neurons. So the, so the nerve system shut down first. Just shut off, yeah, and in the brainstem, it would be respiratory drive neurons. Thank you, thank you. You know, just like a, an anesthetic, I mean, if, yeah. like propofol, okay? Propofol is a perfect example. It's a GABA-releasing drug, or GABA-mimetic, and, um, and everybody knows about it because it's what killed Michael Jackson. So that drug has very similar effects. And by the way, if you combine the two, it's twice as, it's actually two plus two equals five. So you're even more likely to die. A quick question. If long-term and kind of excessive use of the alcohol, as you explained, sort of decreases uh, your reward pathway or sort of becomes anti-reward and you get all these negative effects, then how does that not why do you still have addiction then? Like, how does that, it seems like the, you would no longer biologically be dependent on it or? Well, in, you know, in those kind of what I call terminal alcoholics, basically the only way they can get through the day, the only way that they can even manage is to drink. 
And so this is what we call negative reinforcement. So at, at some point you reach a, 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 a almost, uh, what's the word I'm searching for, but it, it's a gut feeling, almost, pun intended, that, that if you don't have a drink, you're gonna be in so much pain and misery that you're gonna die. And so they drink now to avoid pain, not for the pleasure. Pleasure is gone. And there's always this, and it's not complete, okay? Even a heroin addict who is toked up on enormous doses of heroin that's far beyond you know, what would kill you. I'm assuming you're not a heroin addict. Um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, will still get some pleasure for that from the, from the injection, but it's much less than they got the first time. And, and it's mainly to relieve the pain of not taking the opiate. And it's the same with alcohol. I want to take up all of Ben's time, so. Oh, thank you. I was just wondering, um, how can you explain the success of Alcoholics Anonymous and of so many people having a complete reversal of their alcoholism. I mean, they're technically, I guess they're always alcoholics, but they're able to uh, completely abstain from alcohol, some of them for the rest of their lives with. That's a, that's a really good question, and there's not a whole lot of science around it, but if I was to speculate, which I will do, because I'm me, um, I would argue that social interaction is a very, very powerful reinforcer. It's a very powerful reward. We are human beings, we're primates, we interact with other primates. And not to be demeaning, but when you're an Alcoholics Anonymous, you're forming bonds with people and being reinforced for that behavior, which is a big boost. Um, and, and there are other parts to Alcoholics Anonymous, but that's one of the positive reinforcing parts. Uh, one of the parts other parts is that you, they have a lot of emphasis on getting rid of the guilt that's associated with, with alcoholism. And so guilt is driving your dynorphin system, if you'll permit me. It's driving your CRF system. It's a major stressor, guilt. And you know part of Alcoholics Anonymous is you have to go make amends to everyone you've offended. And so that's part of the process. So there's a whole bunch of sources of reinforcement and, and I would argue that that's slowly but surely reducing your stress system by removing the guilt and facilitating your reward system by the social interaction. And so you're rebuilding your reptile brain in the right direction. That's the way I would put it. And I think cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational enhancement therapy, they utilize the similar things. You're, you're using your own brain to recover. Okay, thank you very much. I think we will save questions yeah. for us. After Ben Goh has spoken, so he has enough time. Can we get the I forgot to mention that Dr. Gao is director of the liver section of NIAAA, Liver Disease. Um, good afternoon. It is my uh, <clears throat> great pleasure to uh, give a lecture with my boss, uh, George Coop. You know, the <clears throat> he just gave uh, nicely uh, how this alcohol affects the brain. So uh, today I will mainly discuss, you know, how you know alcohol drinking affects the liver, uh, which is another uh, major problem, you know, caused by the alcohol drinking. Well, this. <clears throat> this saying on uh, the liver, you know, everyone has one. I mean, if you don't have one, you're probably in big trouble. And uh, if you take, you know, good care of yourself, your liver probably looks like this. Very nice, very nice, uh, red, soft, and tender. 
So uh, what happens if you drink a you know, large amount of alcohol? So the, uh, the, first thing, the first response of the liver to alcohol drinking is a fat accumulation. So your liver um, becomes uh, you know, fatty. Uh, the, uh, the pale color, there's a lot of fat accumulating in the liver. The fatty liver um, is, re uh, is reversible. If you stop drinking, your, um, this liver can you know, recover to the normal liver. You know, uh, luckily, you know, in majority, about 60 to 70 percent of uh, um, you know, heavy drinkers, they probably you know, maintain the fatty liver for a long, long time. So they have a fatty liver for life. You know. But unfortunately, there is about 30 to 40 percent of them they may also develop inflammation in the liver. They have uh, infiltrated uh, many, many inflammatory cells in the liver. You have a lot of inflammation in the liver. So we call alcoholic steroidohepatitis, or call ASH. The, um, most of the early stage of um, alcoholic steroidohepatitis is also uh, reversible. If you stop drinking, the liver can recover. But even some uh, alcoholic hepatitis, even you stop drinking, they still progress to more severe form of liver injury, such as uh, cirrhosis. The cirrhosis, usually we believe is you know, e irreversible. It cannot reverse back to the uh, normal liver. But accumulating evidence, you know, some patient with early cirrhosis, it still can reverse to the, uh, to back to the normal. You know, after you have a liver cirrhosis, uh, the chance to become the liver cancer is very high. Usually, it's one to three percent of a liver cirrhosis become to the cancer, liver cancer, every year. Well, uh, this is the liver histology. You can see this is a normal liver, nice structure, hepatocyte. In the fatty liver, you can see uh, there's many, you know, fat droplets accumulate in the hepatocyte. So it's a lot of a fat. In the alcoholic steroid hepatitis, you are not only have this fat droplet, but you also have an infiltration of many inflammatory cells, immune cells in the liver. But in the cirrhosis, actually you lost, the, um, you know, many hepatocytes was lost, liver cell was lost, was uh, filled by um, fibrotic tissue or scar, or scar tissue. In most of those chronic alcoholic liver disease, you know, most of the patients, they do not have a symptom. Even in that you have a liver cirrhosis, if it's a com compensated, you don't have any symptom. It looks like a normal um, person. But in some patients, you know, they can develop, uh, you know, acute alcoholic hepatitis with a significant, you know, clinical syndrome. The most, of, uh, the typical one is jaundice, hepatomegaly, fever, uh, neutrophilia, the liver enzyme, the AST and ALT ratio is more than two. They also have many uh, non-specific uh, uh, clinical syndrome. The uh, short-term uh, mortality for those alcoholic hepatitis is very high. Usually on uh, 30 to 50 percent of them, you know, after in route to the hospital, uh, 30 to 50 percent, percent of them die within uh, 30 days or 60 days. So the next question I want to discuss, you know, how is ethanol, you know, metabolized in the liver? The liver is a major um, organ or major size to, you know, metabolize the um, uh, ethanol or alcohol. This is a hepatocyte. So the ethanol uh, uh, in the cytosol of the hepatocyte can be metabolized by, you know, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase uh, into the uh, acetaldehyde. So ethanol can be also metabolized by CYP2E1 or on catalase into acetaldehyde. But this um, ADH uh, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase is a major enzyme to met metabolize ethanol into the acetaldehyde in the cytosol. When this acetaldehyde in the cytosol can enter the mitochondria, further metabolized by acetaldehyde dehydrogenase 2 into the acetate. So this is the mitochondria. Those acetate can quickly release from the mitochondria into the circulation. The further, you know, uh, metabolized by the muscle or heart tissue into the water or uh, CO2. 
So because we know that everyone um, maybe have a different ability to metabolize the ethanol or alcohol. This is because there's an alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme polymorphism. The one of the most famous uh, the polymorphism is acetaldehyde dehydrogenase 2 polymorphism. In the Western uh, countries, most people have uh, uh, this uh, AOTG2 homozygote glutamate uh, 504. Uh, in this AOTG2 gene, the, uh, the position 504 is glutamate. So have a two copy. So those have a normal uh, the, uh, enzyme activity, which can quick, quickly metabolize acetaldehyde into the uh, acetate. But in the 40 to 50 percent, you know, East Asians or you know, Afri um, American Asians, so the one of uh, uh, this uh, glutamate 504 is replaced by lysine, uh, uh, this amino, amino acid. So these heterozygotes, they only have uh, six percent of normal activity. So they reduce the enzyme activity reduced by uh, 94 percent. But in uh, also have five to eight percent of the uh, East uh, Asians, actually the two copies of the AOTG2 was replaced by a uh, lysosome, and those uh, homozygotes there's no activity. Basically, those um, people cannot metabolize as uh, as high. So therefore, in those group of um, people, you know, who drink an alcohol, you can very high level as high, which cannot, you know. Uh, uh, metabolize into the acetate. Acetaldehyde can cause the flushing, then cause you know the uh, di di um, vessel dilation. Clearly, you know I'm one of them. So when I drink an alcohol, I get very flushing. Actually, I just discussed it with George Coop. You know many alcohol standard in the U.S. does not uh, fit with uh, with me or with uh, East Asian, because I only drink a half a bottle of a beer. My blood alcohol concentration is very low, but apparently I cannot drive. You know, if I drive in the, uh, in, the, in the road, policemen stop me, but my alcohol concentration is okay, it's very low. So, so we, sh we should you know, probably design a different standard for those um, mutations. Um, so as I mentioned, this alcoholic liver disease uh, in patients with this genotype you know, has been extensively characterized in Western countries, but for the, uh, those liver disease in, uh, in, those, in the patient with those uh, with AODG2, AODG2 deficiency, you know, has has not been uh, studied carefully. So, which may be very different from the patient with uh, AODG2 and one with this uh, phenotype uh, genotype. So, the the question you know I want to ask you know are the individuals who have alcohol flushing reaction more susceptible to alcoholic liver injury or inflammation. Like myself, I drink an alcohol, I get a flushing. You know, whether I'm, I'm you know, more susceptible to alcohol liver injury. To um, answer this question, <coughs> we use this, you know, AODG2, you know, deficient mice or knockout mice. So we feed those mice with an alcohol. They probably also have flushing in, you know, those mice as well. Um, the results showing you know, clearly that as a retired high, this is the first metabolite of ethanol is very high in those mice. You know, unexpectedly, because acetaldehyde usually is very toxic. You know, most people believe you know this thing and cause a problem. So, uh, but surprisingly, you know, in those mice, the fatty liver, the steatosis, uh, blood, you know, the liver enzyme ALT is lower is compared to the wild type of mice. This is really unexpected. However, the liver fibrosis and the inflammation is much higher in those knockout mice compared to the white type of mice. So we, we, we have evidence that this elevated inflammation probably play a compensatory role to uh, trying to repair the liver. That's the reason you have a lower fatty liver, lower liver enzyme. So what does this mean to the patients, to the human? For the uh, people who have, you know, AODG2 deficiency, you, you know, with, when you drink an alcohol, you're flushing, you probably have very high level of acetaldehyde, you know, elevation. Well, if you go to the doctor to, to do, you know, healthy checkup, 
you know, ultrasound looks your liver you know, looks okay. You, are, you you don't have a fatty liver. Your liver enzyme in your blood is okay. It's not you know it's normal. But you know, may but it may you have a big liver problem. You have liver fibrosis or inflammation, which can you know further you know, progress to more severe like cirrhosis. So even you have a, a normal liver or normal uh, liver enzyme, but you still be cautious. You may have a liver fibrosis inflammation. You know, unfortunately, we don't have a non-invasive biomarkers for diagnosis. You know, the early fibrosis or inflammation. So the second question I want to discuss, you know, how does ethanol cause a liver injury? You know, ethanol is a kind of a carbohydrate. You know, it's a very simple carbohydrate. So we eat so many carbohydrates. Why we are drinking such, you know, this simple carbohydrate cause such a broad spectrum of liver disease, like a injury. For the fatty liver. So ethanol and it is metabolized, you know, do not you know, contribute directly to fat synthesis. They do not, you know, uh, uh, they cannot synthesize for the fat. The reason on ethanol leads to the fatty liver probably is through dysregulating the fat metabolism. It has been shown alcohol and it is metabolized. It is a metabolism associated oxidative stress can promote fat synthesis and inhibit the fatty, fatty acid beta oxidation. So that means when you're drinking alcohol in your liver, the fat you know, synthesis is more, but it cannot uh, degrade it. So that's the reason it causes accumulation of you know, fat droplet in the, uh, in the liver. For the alcoholic steroid uh, hepatitis inflammation, how alcohol drinking causes inflammation. Uh, it is, has been shown alcohol can, uh, drinking can increase gut bacteria overgrowth. You probably have more bacteria you know, growth in your gut. Then also dysbiosis, the gut permeability increase. Then all of this uh, factor can lead to, you know, more gut bacteria products, such as endotoxin, into the liver. Then stimulate immune cells, cytokine production, oxidative stress, then cause infiltration of inflammatory cells in the liver. Another one, just cirrhosis. You know, cirrhosis, is a slow uh, progressing disease in which healthy liver tissue is replaced by the scar tissue. Those scar tissue is mainly produced by activated hepatic cell cells in the liver. So the alcohol itself on acetaldehyde, high, it is metabolized and directly stimulate cell cell activation. So they can produce the collagen uh, liver fibrosis. Then also this oxidative, oxidative stress, cytokine, can also activate cell cells, then causes the fibrosis. So again, this ethanol drinking causes you know so a broad uh, spectrum of uh, alcoholic liver injury. So the next question I want to discuss, as you mentioned, you know some heavy drinker you know just have a fatty liver for a long time, but why some fat, uh, heavy drinkers you know do progress to the more severe uh, form of a liver injury? Well, of course, there's many uh, genetic and acquired factors, you know, have been identified, but uh, many of them have, have not been uh, confirmed. I don't, you know, I do not have time to discuss all of them. Today, just uh, discuss two um, items. One is the drinking pattern, another one is obesity. The drinking pattern, well, if in a human, uh, I can, you know, uh, divide into, you know, chronically and slowly drink you know, without, you know, getting drunk. Probably many people um, do like this. Well, you know, some people like a binge drinking, you know, get drunk all the time. They are happy. In the alcoholic hepatitis patient, uh, you know, most of those patients actually have uh, a history of a chronic, long-term chronic drinking plus uh, recent excessive drinking. So the, basically it's a chronic plus binge drinking in those alcoholic hepatitis patients. Then if you look at the you know, uh, animal model, if you study alcoholic liver injury, the animal models, um, the most widely used model you know, over the last 40 years is to feed the mice with a liquid diet containing ethanol for four to six weeks. Because the mice you know, do not like drinking alcohol. So we have to put the uh, ethanol 
in a liquid diet. So they eat and drink together. So this model you know, is very uh, easy to perform. But the problem is that only cause a uh, very mild you know, fatty liver, very mild liver injury. Does not cause a significant liver injury. So I, I guess this drinking uh, feeding model is probably similar to the, this human drinking like this, slowly drinking as no, uh, never get drunk. Because you know, in this alcoholic hepatitis patient, because they usually have a chronic drinking, and they are also plus the reason of binge drinking. Based on this evidence, so we actually recently developed this new model that we call you know, chronic feeding um, plus the binge. Basically, we feed the mice with a liquid diet containing ethanol you know, for you know, up to 12 weeks or eight weeks. Basically, these mice you know, eat, drink slowly every day, you know, 24 hours. Then at the end, we give them a single binge, a large, large dose of ethanol, like a binge which really causes significant liver injury, you know, like alcoholic hepatitis. Here I just give you a piece of data uh, where this is normal liver. Uh, this is uh, uh, the liver from the mice, chronic feed alcohol for eight weeks. You can see the pale. Liver histology, that's a fat accumulation. But this one is the liver from the mice, chronic alcohol feeding for eight weeks. Then then we give them a single dose binge, between one uh, single binge. You can see the liver uh, clearly is you know, more pale than this one. If you look at the liver histology, there's massive fat accumulation. As you can see, this single binge can you know, really make the liver uh, worse and worse. If you look at the liver enzyme, if you, uh, this is uh, transaminase, the marker for liver damage. If you look at the uh, chronic ethanol feeding for eight weeks, the liver enzyme in the blood slightly elevate. But in this chronic eight weeks plus binge is markedly elevate compared to this chronic itself. So this suggests this chronic plus binge ethanol feeding or drinking is really bad for the liver. That can induce severe liver injury. So the next I want to briefly discuss you know, the alcohol and obesity. Whereas alcohol and obesity you know, it's two of the major problems in this country. So how does alcohol, the interaction of alcohol and fat affect the liver? Well, the, on, uh, the obesity-associated liver disease have very similar pattern, uh, the disease progression as alcoholic liver disease. Obesity also develop a fatty liver, steatosis, then also develop, uh, develop inflammation in the liver. So we call non-alcoholic steroidal hepatitis that can also progress cirrhosis and the uh, liver cancer. But again, but this alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are two separate diseases. Uh, the diagnosis of alcoholic liver disease is detailed published in the American uh, Liver Society on the guideline. I don't want to go, to through, uh, go through this. Then also for the diagnosis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, they also publish this on a guideline, you know, how to uh, diagnose this disease. You know, although there are, you know, there are two separate diseases, you know, you know, as you can see here, you know, most people with you know, obesity or overweight, we all always drink. So that means those uh, fat and alcohol always, you know, together interact. So then question ask, you know, how you know, obesity and alcohol contribute to pathogenesis, pathogenesis of a fatty liver disease. You know, how much from alcohol or how much from the fat? The, uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, VJ Shah, with several, you know, hepatologists, they actually developed this on um, alcoholic liver disease, non-alcoholic liver, uh, fatty liver disease uh, index. This is a website. In this website, actually, you can, uh, there's a formula. You can enter the value like uh, AST and uh, ALT and also MCV, weight and uh, height and gender. That give you a score. Then uh, based on a score, that can tell you, you know, this fatty liver disease, how much from alcohol drinking and how much for the, from the fat. So I, I think this maybe is a very you know, useful uh, model to distinguish, you know, uh, alcoholic liver disease and a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. One of the most uh, uh, the typical uh, difference is the AST and ALT ratio 
uh, in the alcoholic liver disease and the non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. In the alcoholic liver disease, the ratio usually is the AST, AOT ratio is more than two. In the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the ratio is less than one. This is also uh, occurs in the mice. If you uh, feed the mice with alcohol, the, this ratio is more than two. But if you uh, feed the mice with high fat, this mice obese, those enzyme ratio is uh, less than one. If the patient have some this ratio between one and two, they probably you know mix alcohol drinking and uh, obesity or fat. So why you know the reason the reason why the uh, alcohol drinking have a you know higher level of AST than ART, this is probably because the AST this is transaminase is a mitochondria enzyme. We know alcohol is uh, um, you know, it's a poison for the mitochondria, which can uh, significantly cause the mitochondria injury, which then, you know, affect the AST more than the ART. That's the reason why the uh, alcohol causes AST elevation higher than ART. Well, so, the, um, so how does alcohol affect the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? There's, a, a, there's a many um, publications already document Excessive alcohol drinking uh, clearly exacerbates non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, and the liver cancer. So this is probably uh, there's many uh, mechanisms. Here I just show you one study uh, from Dr. Hidi and Sugimoto's group. They actually feed the mice with high-fat dye and also uh, alcohol together. If you feed high fat and all alcohol itself alone, you can see elevation of liver enzyme is slightly elevated. This is a liver enzyme. But if you put them together, it's much higher compared to uh, those just feeding on uh, this diet alone. So those clearly this alcohol drinking, high fat feeding can synergistically induce steatosis, liver injury, inflammation, and fibrosis. Of course, there's some you know, multiple mechanisms contribute to this synergistic effect. Well, you know, most of us, you know, are not excessive drinking. Most of us maybe, you know, is a moderate drinking. So how about, you know, uh, moderate alcohol drinking affect this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? There's also, you know, endogenous ethanol. In, uh, because we, we have a gut bacteria can produce a lot of alcohol. Most people, most people believe, you know, every day our gut bacteria can produce two bottles of Two bottles of uh, um, beer, you know. This, uh, so we do have endogenous ethanol. How endogenous ethanol affect the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? So there's uh, several um, publications suggest you know there's a moderate alcohol drinking actually uh, ameliorate is beneficial for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But in contrast, there's a paper published in uh, 2013. So this suggest those in a low concentration endogenous alcohol actually promote NASH, promote alcoholic fatty liver disease. So they believe in those NASH patients, the gut alcohol producing bacteria is elevated. So they can increase blood on alcohol concentration. So this ethanol can enter the liver, you know, stimulate liver inflammation, cause the non-alcoholic liver, uh, fatty liver disease. So apparently, these two uh, is a conflict. You know, moderate alcohol drinking improve it. Endogenous alcohol, you know, promotes promote this uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we probably need more study to uh, clarify or confirm this. So then the question: What should we recommend uh, to our patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease regarding alcohol use? This article published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. So they actually recommend until further data from a rigorous perspective on studies become available, people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease should award alcohol of any type or any amount. But this is a pretty um, tough uh, statement. So uh, finally, probably have a uh, maybe a couple of minutes just discuss the therapy for alcoholic liver disease. You know, for, uh, you, know, you know, stop drinking probably is the most effective uh, therapy for alcoholic liver disease. You stop drinking, you probably can reverse fatty liver 
it can also reverse uh, some, most of this alcoholic steroid hepatitis. But for the cirrhosis, there's no uh, FDA approved anti-fibrotic drugs. The manage management of alcoholic cirrhosis and the liver cancer is very similar to the other causes, such as viral hepatitis uh, cirrhosis. The, the only uh, uh, important treatment is for alcoholic hepatitis. As I mentioned, this alcoholic hepatitis have very high short-term mortality. You know, 30 to 50% of them die in the hospital after in the hospital. So because of the inflammation, you know, it, it is believed is a key factor leading to the liver failure. So most people focus, you know, control the inflammation. That's the reason uh, the steroid and the protein lysinon has been used for the treatment of alcoholic hepatitis over the last 40 years. The, uh, the protein lysinon was first used for the alcoholic hepatitis in the 1971. Even today, we use the same uh, protocol to treat the alcoholic hepatitis. But the data was very controversial. And uh, uh, most of our um, uh, data suggest those steroid treatment can improve the short-term uh, survival rate. But for the long term, there's no any beneficial effect for the alcoholic hepatitis. So that's the reason NIAAA uh, recently supported four large consortia to conduct you know, translational research for exploring uh, the new therapeutic target for alcoholic hepatitis. Hopefully, we have some new uh, targets available in the near future. And my own group, actually, we identified this new drug in Lulekin 22. So we believe it's very promising. Actually, recently, um, VJ Shah from a Mayo Clinic and I wrote this article. We proposed the combination of therapy. Basically, for the uh, alcoholic, alcoholic hepatitis, inflammation is a key factor, you know, leading to the liver injury. But usually, the liver injury, the liver can regenerate. But the problem in the alcoholic hepatitis, the liver cannot regenerate for some reason. So they have impaired the liver regeneration. They also have many complications. Uh, in the past, we used a steroid to control the inflammation, steroid you know, treatment, but does not you know, control this problem. So we think we can use interleukin 22, so which can promote the liver regeneration and prevent against the hepatocyte damage. Interleukin 22 can also you know, control many of the complications from alcoholic hepatitis such as inhibitor bacterial infection, protect against the kidney injury, and also maintain gut, in, uh, gut barrier in, uh, integrity. So here is a key point for this interleukin 22. This is a cytokine. This is the only, uh, probably the only cytokine that is produced by immune cells, but it does not target immune cells. This is because the immune cells do not express this IL-22 receptor. So the main target epithelial cells, like hepatocyte, liver stem cells, or hepatic cell cells, and some fibroblasts. So we actually uh, demonstrated this I-22 almost 10 years ago. This interleukin-22 can induce hepatocyte and liver stem cell survival, induce hepatocyte liver stem cell proliferation, also induce expression of antibacterial genes. So in collaborate with Generon company, we actually uh, finished the phase one clinical trial. So uh, we are discussing now this is phase 1B and or phase two for alcoholic hepatitis, hopefully uh, maybe early next year or end of this year. So finally, I just want to conclude and also some challenge for alcoholic liver disease in the future. Again, the stop drinking probably is the most effective uh, therapy for alcoholic liver disease. So uh, George uh, just mentioned how to stop drinking. So the overcoming addiction, and also the drink uh, responsibly, you know, binge really is bad for your liver. If you want to drink slowly and enjoy, don't get drunk. Then uh, another question, you know, every heavy, heavy drinkers probably develop a fatty liver, but it's not clear why some get a more severe form of injury, but some uh, do not. The another one, the genetic factors for the susceptibility of alcoholic liver disease are not really clear. The effect of alcoholic liver uh, ARDG2 deficiency, have this deficiency 
affects alcoholic liver disease, we probably still need more study. The pathogenesis of alcoholic liver disease probably is very complex. Maybe it's different from the patient to patient, and it still remains on, on largely on, on, unknown, so we still need to study. The non-invasive biomarkers for diagnosis of early alcoholic liver disease probably is very important, so we still need to study to looking for those uh, markers. There's no uh, approved drugs for the treatment of alcoholic liver disease so far. Hopefully, uh, this consortium and also our study identify some uh, new drugs uh, in the near, near future. Although we develop this chronic plus binge uh, model, but this model still uh, represents early stage of alcoholic liver disease. There's no model really uh, mimic the severe like cirrhotic liver uh, in the mice. So we're still looking, uh, study and looking for the new model for alcoholic liver disease. So I'll stop here, so thank you for attention. Uh, I'd like to ask, why is it that uh, people who are heterozygous for aldehyde uh, dehydrogenase, why do they have such a low, instead of having 50% because they have one wild type copy mm -hmm. and one uh, lysine uh, 504 uh, mutation, why do this, the activity is only 6% instead of 50%? Uh, well, yeah, this is a good question because, the, you know, AFDG2, uh, they form a tetramer. It's four proteins form together. If one was mutated, activity was reduced by uh, 90 percent. Did that answer your question? Hello. Um, I was just wondering about this genetic variation as well. Um, many people remember this in medical school about the, the Asian uh, have a, another genetic variation, but mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to stop them from drinking. I mean, I've been in Japan and, and um, many people enjoy drinks, alcohol drinking. Is it only the 6% that have any problems? The, the 40 to 50% you said? Uh, no, 50 to 40% for the homozygous mutation, we, we saw uh, there's no activity those people probably cannot drink. For those people have a, still have a 6% activity, you know, they still can drink. And I guess if you pra practice drinking more, you okay. probably can drink you more. You practice, okay. <laughs> Great talk. What is your take on those medications such as HEPA, Bionta, I think it's called. It's a vitamin B complex, B1, B6, B12. Some people take that uh, before drinking because it protects their liver or it helps regeneration of liver tissue after drinking. Do you have any opinion on the that? Antioxidant, the vitamin E. Oh, well, there's, a, um, there's a several um, clinical trials use this antioxidant for alcoholic hepatitis, the same as there's no beneficial effect. But again, this is for, uh, for the clinical, clinical trial is a severe alcoholic liver disease. For most of us, if we have, uh, you don't have a liver problem, I think if you, you know, eat some vitamin E, you know, should have some beneficial effect. Well, if we take regarding the alcohol intake. Okay. So, what percentage goes to the liver versus brain? No, for the alcohol drinking, uh, because you go to the gut, they go to the liver first. So the parts of the liver, the probably many of them metabolize into the acetaldehyde acetate, then go to the circulation, then go to the brain. So, so how much go to the liver, how much go? Um, is the distribution in the brain very uniform? No. Because in the early phase, you show the whole part of the brain, and then some part of the brain is activated at a higher level. Is it related to the concentration of the alcohol? I <laughs> can't <laughs> 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 
Wait, maybe you can talk. <laughs> 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 Alcohol likes the water components of the body, so the distribution of the brain is pretty uniform. Uh, where it acts first is still an unknown question to some extent. That, that's one of the things we want to, at the low dose end. At a high dose, uh, ultimately, you'll, you'll be perfusing all the brain fairly quickly. But which pieces get activated first, is, you know, we would have to speculate that there's some components of that basal ganglion I was telling you that are being activated first because that's why you feel the intoxication. But there's probably a frontal cortex component because early on you're disinhibited as well. So, I, you know, I, I, there used to be a diagram, Ken probably saw it somewhere, where there used to be this old diagram where alcohol wa went in a wave through your brain, you know, started in the cortex and moved down. There may be some truth to the fact that the frontal cortex probably gets hit first. So is the metabolism similar? Is the mitochondria in the brain? In the brain? In the brain, but not linear. Uh, no, okay, most, the, the alcohol, you know, is mainly metabolizing the hepatocyte, at least in the, uh, the textbook is said. But in the brain, uh, the many other cell types that do express the alcohol um, metabolized enzyme. And, uh, um, but I mean, it's not, I think it's not been uh, really carefully studied. So we do have uh, this ALDG2 uh, conditional knockout of We can knock out the enzyme in a different cell type, then we can study, um, you know, how those metabolism in the brain affect uh, the behavior or so. Um, recently, uh, more and more uh, people realize that uh, in part of the obesity is not from the eating too much fat. It's in fact too much eating too much of the like, uh, uh, carbohydrate, especially fructose. Fructose. And the fructose also induce that the chronic uh, hepatitis Hepatic is very similar to alcohol. But how much is similar in terms of that uh, higher intake of the fructose and um, alcohol? Uh, so, so what is how much fructose? How much is similar to fructose? No, uh, I think the fructose itself, um, usually fructose, you know, has, um, I think it's produced uh, seven, five grams of calorie per gram. And uh, alcohol produces much higher calories than fructose. And uh, the metabolism um, is, is very different, you know, uh, because alcohol metabolism causes a lot of oxidative stress. And uh, uh, also, uh, as not metabolized, like uh, acetaldehyde, also causes a problem. For the fructose, uh, I don't know whether fructose it itself can cause a problem. Usually, fructose plus high fat diet together. The mix like a Western diet, so they think that synergistically causes the liver problem. Fructose itself may not cause the uh, major liver problem, and I mean uh, this is what I say. George, I wonder if I could ask you a question. Okay. So, <laughs> you you presented this uh, model. You presented this model. Uh, is it applicable, and you infer that it's applicable uh, to a variety of circumstances, from drugs to, uh, to alcohol. What, would that also include things like uh, obesity itself, uh, compulsive eating? Is there a similar pattern? Uh, uh, from the neurophysiologic point of view. And if this is a common pattern, is there evidence for specificity in the circuitry for any of these, call them agonists as systems? Uh, I think that's on. Yeah, so I think Jean Jack's gonna answer that question, right? I mean, Nora has a hypothesis and uh, Nora Volkoff and and a number of other people have argued this from a phenotypic uh, picture that, that there are elements of compulsive eating that resemble elements of compulsive drug-taking behavior. So we assume that the same circuits are involved. Uh, 
but but for the most part, it's still largely an assumption. There is some imaging work done on compulsive eating. There's some on internet addiction. There's some on compulsive gambling, and the basal ganglia do light up in 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 some of the studies that have been done. And there are D2 receptor uh, decreases in some some of the studies, but it's pretty nascent at this point. I think it's an early early stages. Uh, do drugs enter the cycles at different places? Absolutely. So. You know, if you're doing heroin or opiates, you're going to be entering largely through the mu opioid receptor. And that's going to have a different profile. I mean, opiate addiction is not alcoholism. Um, there are simil similarities, but there are differences. Um, in, for one, uh, with, with opiates, I mean, the pain of withdrawal is excruciating, all right? The pain of alcohol withdrawal is no, not tiptoeing through the tulips, but it's physical pain sometimes as well as emotional pain with, with opiates. And the same with psychostimulants. They're going to be entering through largely the release of dopamine. And, and you, know, it, you know, there's some, you know, nicotine's probably influencing largely the dopamine system. So, I mean, there are different ways in, of the, in the cycle. Um, and benzodiazepines, I mean, you know, people for years said they didn't have dependence liability, but we now know that they're being abused, and, and they don't really make you high very much, but, but they probably are entering through the anxiety withdrawal negative affect states, because once you've started taking large amounts of benzos, one of the culprits is alprazolam or Xanax. It's really hard to get off of Xanax, you know, so. Why is the center of role is so toxic? Oh, I don't know. That's for Bin. I mean, Mesimo? Yeah. Mesimo. We don't know study Mesimo. <laughs> Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. The mix in the alcohol, right? Anyone can answer? I'm not sure. I, 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 knew, I knew that at one time. Yeah, right, yeah. The pudding. Yeah. 